Welcome to the opening round of our 2016 Monster Energy AMA Supercross and FIM World Championship preview shows right here from the Racer X Illustrated headquarters in Morgantown, West Virginia. Jason Wygant, Steve Mathis, Jason Thomas will also be joined by David Pingree throughout this five part series, five parts. So if we do not talk about your favorite rider in this show, don't leave a comment on the bottom of the YouTube page saying, oh, they didn't even mention Justin Borsha. Barsha will be mentioned in another show, okay? I'm sure you can find other things to complain about. That's what people on YouTube do. Today, we're talking first about number one, which is Ryan Dungey. There's a lot that can happen in 2016. We're gonna talk about what a deep field it is as always, but we need to celebrate the moment and celebrate the guy who is right now on top of the Supercross world, Ryan Dungey. You can either pause on your YouTube player right now or just pause with us to mark this moment down. Ryan Dungey is the man in Supercross. The man. Ryan Dungey is the man. There is no doubt about it. Now, we didn't know that'd be the case last year, but it was a dominant performance. Yeah, I think with the departure of Ryan Villapoto, we looked at the field as being more wide open than it truly was. Eli Tomek had some problems. Kenny Roxon had some problems. But regardless of that, I think we underestimated, or I did, you I did, did. Yeah. underestimated that new bike, the new KTM 450 SSF, XSF factory race replica, and Alden Baker's influence on Ryan Dungey. Look, we know Alden Baker, we know his program, everything else, but Man, Dungey was great. The bike was great, his starts were good, his fitness, of course, has always been good, but it seemed like the mental game yeah. of working with Alden was maybe better than ever, and uh, Ryan himself seemed like in a better place mentally. I don't think he stressed as much. I know from talking to people, he, you know, he, he really focused on bike setup and a lot of changes. And I think in this year, he was just left things alone a little bit, didn't change as many things, and was in a happier place. You said it on last year's show that you wanted to hear less of the changing, changing, changing the bike, and that's exactly what Dungey did, and he rode that much better. But there actually was one guy, one guy in the well, entire industry I know that predicted. Wasn't me. No, I, I, I predicted Ken Roxham yeah. would win last year. One guy that I know picked Dungey was you. Jason was Thomas, me. you actually predicted Dungey would win the title last year. Uh, that's the only person I know that did that. Why, and what do you feel for this year? Well, I felt like with Ryan Villapoto's departure, he was kind of the next man up. Uh, you can look back through, you know, the history books, and even in the years where he was kind of invisible, he was still right there. You know, maybe he wasn't the flashiest guy, but, you know, he, he has the diesel nickname, whether he likes it or not, for a reason. He's always there once he gets going. Uh, and we saw that last year. Uh, there were factors, though. I, I think his personal life was in a better place than it ever had been. The bike was much improved, uh, which I think we'll see other guys benefit from that as well. But I just think everything lined up. And on top of that, he was the next best guy years going back in points. So I think that's going to continue. I look for him to win again next year. I don't know if it'll be as dominant. I think Tomac will be better. I think Roxon will put in a better 17 race series. Uh, but I still think at the end of the year, come you know May 7th, I, I think we'll see Dungeon on top again. We were talking off camera about this, and you're just saying the ups and downs of the season, which we always forget. We're just so focused on round one and what's going to happen. But that long stretch just seems so suited to him. It is, and I think that's a strength of his. I think he knows how to put a long series together. He knows that, you know, one bad weekend or one fourth or one fifth, it's not the end of the world. He still got that 16, 17 points. He didn't crash out. And that's really the, the, his biggest strength is minimizing any damage. He never has that just, you know, zero point weekend where you see these other guys have that mistake. So I think that's why he ends up wrapping up the series with two or three races to go. He just eliminates those mistakes and you know, as we saw last year, he won more races than he had ever won before. Yeah, the speed is somewhat underrated sometimes with Dungey. He's just about as fast as everyone else and more consistent. And he might be even better this year because that Alden Baker thing was only a hybrid deal in the preseason. He didn't live down where Alden was. He visited him every once in a while. Now he has moved there. He's a full part of the Alden boot camp. Let's send it over to David Pingree with some mathematical scientific analysis of Dungey's chances working with Baker full time in the preseason for 2016. Ping. All right, thanks, Weege. It's great to be back here in Morgantown at the Racer X offices and see all the family out here. When we're talking about Alden, you know, you've got to really look at the differences between last year and this year. Last season, he was coming off the Dis Nations. He had the Monster Cup, the straight rhythm. He really didn't have an off season. And so Alden had to take him where he was and start working to get ready for that season. This year, he turned down the Dis Nations, which was a, a very strategic move. And uh, he's given him the rest that he needs. You know, Alden has a good program that's periodized to make him peak when he needs to peak and be strong all season long. So they're focusing on that, and I think that's gonna pay off. Um, a big thing with Dungey, and a reason why he was so successful this year, there was the bike, there was all these things that also added to it, but 
Um, Alden is, is really good at taking all the guesswork out. And Ryan Dungey was very hard on himself. He didn't, he never had a work ethic issue, but it was, am I doing it right? Am I doing enough? He was always kind of in his head thinking about, was he doing it right? Was he not? And that's the thing with Alden's program that's great is all the guesswork's taken out. The track record's there and he just says, look, you do what I tell you to do and you're gonna win. You're gonna be ready and you're gonna be the best guy out there. And so I think for Ryan, it just took all that guesswork out. He focused on his riding, he listened to Alden and the results speak for themselves. So another good thing going on down there, you know, you've got those guys in their little inner sanctum in Claremont, Baker's factory and inside that world, it's just Alden and Ryan Dungey doing their thing. But in the same spot, you've also got Adam Cincerilla, you got Jason Anderson, you got Muskin, you got some really fast guys down there that he can ride with every single day. And if you look back in history, whether it's Rick Johnson and Jeff Stanton, or Ryan Villapoto when he brought Ken Roxon down there, anytime two guys that are really good race together and practice together, it elevates both their levels. And I think you're going to see some great guys coming out of the Baker's factory this year, and I think Ryan Dungey's going to contend for that title again. Okay, thanks, Ping. Let's get some more analysis here on uh, Dunge. He was the forgotten man. Now he's just the man. Also, the team manager is the man. Do you like this combination again for 2016? Well, I'm going with JT here. Yeah. Uh, I, I like Ryan Dungey to repeat. Uh, I think if you were in Vegas and you were betting on it, I think he's a slight favorite ahead of Kenny Roxon and Eli Tomac to keep his number one plate again. He's got the bike. He's got the trainer. He's got everything. I'm with you, Dunge. I'm with you this year. You've always been a Dunge guy. Always, been, always a, been a always been a dunge guy. See you next weekend, buddy. If everybody's gonna pick uh, Dunge as champ, I'm just gonna go opposite. So if it doesn't work out that way, I look like a genius. So I'm gonna pick Ken Roxon to uh, win the title this year, which is just like what both you and I did last year. And sadly, we actually have the oh, no. clip to make ourselves look bad. Here is our prediction for Ken Roxon's 2015 season from 12 months ago. So I've put Roxon as a slight favorite in my mind for the title. Slight, mm -hmm. you agree? Yeah, I'm gonna go right there with okay. you. I think if you took all this data we have and put it in a machine, that's what it's gonna push out. It's gonna be close. It's not Ryan Villapoto style, but I would say, yeah, I think Roxton's favorite going here. All right. It's hard to believe Roxton. considering it's a team that hasn't even won a race before and it's only his second year. Isn't that crazy? Well, how about that? So the thing we thought was strange last year was a team that had not won a race going for the title, and that actually turned out to be a bigger deal than we maybe predicted. The year started great, but overall there was a lot of drama as they adjusted to Kenny, he adjusted to them, and they all adjusted to that championship style pressure. Yeah, look, if Kenny hadn't had the ankle injury in Oakland, none of this, you know, would have maybe been, even come up. Yep. He could have been well on the way to winning the Supercross title. But it did happen, and then there was internal team drama, which we saw all year long. Finally, near the end of the national, it seemed like Kenny straightened it out, but it's a tough year. Yeah, he has a two-year deal, and you have to give Kenny credit for salvaging it. His dad put an interview out in a German magazine pretty much lighting up the team. And Kenny knows he's still going to work for these guys for at least another 12 months. So he did a great job of mending all those fences. And what you saw at Monster Cup, even straight rhythm was good. The last national moto of the year he won. It sure seems like they're riding that ship now. Yes, but this is a huge year for Kenny, like you said. His contract is up. Honda's looking to get back on top. They're going to have an open space for a guy of Kenny's stature. This is a massive year for Kenny. This is going to make or break him. If he wins, if everything's great, I think he resigns with RCH. He goes, stays on Suzuki, and everybody's happy. If this thing goes sideways, I think he's out of there. And they're doing everything they can to make him happy. We saw a huge switch from Showa suspension to KYB that he used at Monster Cup, and he did win on that suspension. So let's throw it over to Ping for a little more analysis of what it's like to change components for a team and a rider like that. Thanks, Weege. You know, uh, 2015 showed us a really fast Ken Roxon early in the year. If he hadn't had that mistake early on and hurt his ankle, we could have seen a different series for sure. And I think he's got the speed again coming back to do that. Um, this fork issue has become a, a pretty big drama for his race team. You know, Suzuki's marketing department is pushing the Showa Triple Air Chamber Fork. For them, it's a marketing tool and for him to switch to KYB definitely throws a wrench into their plans. Uh, those Japanese manufacturers, though, they all switch between the two, Showa and KYB, both Japanese companies, and there's a lot of recipro reciprocity between all of those brands. I don't think it's a big issue for Japan corporate, it's just in the marketing department when they're trying to sell that Showa Triple Air Chamber Fork and push that as a selling feature, and Ken doesn't like it, a lot of guys don't like it, uh, that becomes a problem. Either way, I think that you gotta give him what he wants. If that's what he's comfortable on, you got to go that way. Uh, results for a race team are the bottom line. Look at what Trey Kennard did when he made the switch. If that's the feel he needs, that's what you do. You make it happen. And as long as you've got enough time to plan, order the forks, get that stuff, it's doable for the race teams. You may have to put up some complaints, but uh, look, when you're standing on top of the podium at Anaheim, 
all of those go away. So I think at the end of the day, you gotta really look at that. And there's only two options here. You know, you've either got Showa or you've got KYB, and you gotta take your pick. Both of them have a nice soft feel. I think he's gonna do great on what he's got. Back to you guys in the studio. Okay, that's what Ping thinks. Uh, give us your breakdown, JT, of uh, Ken Roxon's chances and also some of the team changes that have gone on. See, I think Kenny's gonna do really well. Uh, obviously, he came out swinging last year, won Anaheim one fairly easily. Uh, yeah. Looked well on his way, as Steve said, to winning the title. Then things went poorly. He made the big mistake at Oakland, and then it just kind of snowballed. Uh, we didn't even know he was hurt at Oakland until the Atlanta injury happened, which he talked about was previously already hurt, ended up missing races. So I expect a similar start for Ken Roxon. I think he's gonna start very strong. We've seen that in every championship he's ever been in. He comes out right away winning races. The big question is, can he avoid that mid-season slump? Can he avoid the big crash or the injury or even just a, you know, a fall off of results? Uh, I don't expect him to miss races. I think he'll stay healthy, but I just don't think he's going to have enough as the season winds down to fight off Dungey as Dungey builds momentum. Because at some point they're going to cross paths, I believe. I think Dungey will get better and I think Roxon may drop off a bit and I think Dungey will come out ahead. Yeah, it's true. Even in the great seasons that Kenny has had here in the U.S., it's always been better at the first half than the second. And he's yet to prove to us that he can be as strong right at the end, at the beginning. Even when he won the 450 motocross title two years ago, he still kind of faded off at the end. I think the real test is when you have a newer team like that and a private team is how do they handle the bad days? And that's where they got in trouble. Now, there's a, a, a different switch this year with Eli Tomac, but he's going to maybe the most championship proven team. Tomac now on Monster Energy, Factory Kawasaki. So this is a big difference. This is a totally proven unit. They've been there, they've done it, but it's a new bike for Eli and his prep time is cut because of the injuries he had coming in. What do you think? Yeah, this is gonna be interesting to see. And it's a little bit like Roxton last year, although like you said, the injury. Um, I think Tomac's gonna do well. He's, I think he's gonna win races. I think he's gonna be up there, but man, if he can't cure his starts and or first lap problems that we've seen. He keeps giving Dungeon Rocks and these guys uh, too many seconds to make up. So he's got to fix that. He's got to fix a bit of decision making out on the track. Now, pure balls out, raw speed. I think Tomac's got it. Yeah. But on the new bike with these existing problems that we've seen, I, I just, I'm not sure if I, I like him to take a title this year, but we'll see. I mean, Eli, certainly, uh, we know he'll be fit. We know he'll be trying hard, and it should be interesting to see. Yeah, it's all relative. When we're talking about talent like Tomac, yeah. Roxon, and Dunge, we know they're going to be fast. We know they're going to be good. We actually have a graphic here of the last couple of high-profile team switches for top riders and how they did uh, with one brand or the other. James Stewart, longtime Kawasaki guy, he switched to Yamaha. There really wasn't much of a drop-off. Uh, Justin Barsha didn't have what he wanted his last year with Honda wasn't great either last year on the Yamaha. So it's really a mixed bag of how these team switches really work. And Roxon won two in a KTM and two in a Suzuki in the two years he switched. So it's really hard to say. Um, so we'll swing it over here to Ping and uh, JT and, and see what they think about uh, Ken, Tomac, and Kawasaki get to where they want to be. So what I want to ask you about Ping here is um, the Kawasaki's actually changed quite a bit this year. Tomac's behind the eight ball. He had double shoulder surgery, full reconstruction of the rotator cuff. That's a bad one to come back from in general. And then switching to a new team, is that a problem? You know, he's, he's definitely got a lot of work in front of him. And I've never had complete shoulder reconstructions like that. I've done some AC separations, which is baby poop compared to what he's gone through. <laughs> but um, I just, I believe in that kid. I believe in his program. And I think from the videos I've already seen of him riding, mm -hmm. um, my guess is he was out running and cycling the minute that he could. His fitness will be okay. Um, he already looks very comfortable. I don't think speed will be an issue. Uh, he may not be as polished as he wants to become Anaheim, but I think after a few rounds, uh, I, I think you're just delusional if you don't think he's going to be up in the mix for, for race wins. Um, I'm, I'm very confident in, in how well he's going to do. That new bike is, um, it is all new, yeah. but it's all better. Uh, there's nothing about that that's, I think going to throw that race team. I think those guys are pretty on it. And uh, I don't think setup on that new bike will be that big of a deal. Yeah, it's interesting. KTM made huge changes with their bike and gets all this love and all this credit for it. But it's not like the Cowie isn't changed just as much. They lost a ton of weight. It's a lot more light and uh, nimble. So you've ridden them back to back, the 15 and the 16. It's a lot better. I just think the change between the old Cowie and the new one is less than the old KTM and the new one. I see. You know what I'm saying? So gotcha. I think that's why the discrepancy there. Uh, it was quite a significant improvement for the KTM, where the Cowie was already really good, mm -hmm. and they've just made it a little better. So, gotcha. What do you think of the switch here and coming off of the double shoulder surgeries? There's a lot of variables. Uh, 
team switch. I mean, basically shoulder switch. Like he, he he's changing everything. Bionic. Right, right. Yeah. So uh, I agree with Ping. I think he will be very good this season. The qu real question comes down to it for me: Can he minimize the point loss at the beginning? Because I don't think he's going to come out as ready as he wants to be. Just like Ping said. Uh, so can he lose a couple points here and there and only be down 10 points when he hits a stride? Because at some point, I think a few races in, even if it's a month in, he's going to be there. And there will be nobody that he lines up against where he's, he's worried about or even thinks about. I think he's going to be winning races. Um, we're just going to have to find when that race is and say he's, if he's down 10 points or less at that point, uh, it's going to be, it's gonna be a, a you know, photo finish because he is going to be, I think he will be better on the Kawasaki than he was on the Honda, I do. And if I can add one thing too, you know, I think one thing they were always looking for in that Honda was steering. He always was searching. I don't think he was ever really truly happy. And I think he's going to be happy with the way this new bike works. The one thing, as JT is mentioning, he's got to be able to um, take the emotion out of his racing a little bit. You know, last year at San Diego, he and Reed got into it and he just went nuts a little bit. And that kind of reaction, that emotional reaction when you're racing is not good. And uh, I think it's hurt him in the past. And if he can get past that and say, okay, tonight it's going to be a fourth. That's what I'm, you know. That's as good as it's going to be tonight. We'll build from there. I think he's he'll be okay. If he if he gets clipped by somebody, bumps into someone, and loses his mind, uh, it's going to be another long year for him. I almost wonder if because he's coming in at say 95% instead of 100, if that almost makes him temper his expectations and learn that consistency. Because we all know the other ingredients are there. We'll we'll see if that makes a difference. And you're saying, JT, what race will it be where he see him at his best? Well, we get all pumped on these California rounds, and there's so much hype. There's a whole stretch midway through the year where you go through Daytona. We'll be back in Toronto this year in the middle of March. It's right around then. That's kind of the dog days of the season. If he's still in it at that point, you're right. He could be really good. It'll be good for us to be back in Toronto. That was a really cool race. We missed it last year. We'll be back there on March the 17th. And a reminder, every race is live on television via Fox Sports. So good job to the folks at Feld Motorsports for bringing that back. Go to supercrosslive.com for more information on Monster Energy Supercross. For everyone here, thanks for watching. This is just part one of a five-part series, so we got plenty more coming your way.